Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cronin, let me ask you a question about your views on the First Amendment. There you are, the First Amendment protections for free speech. What limitations, if any, can the government place on political speech that someone might see as gruesome or graphic? Uh, uh, Senator, there are very few limitations on, on free speech. It would be um, a speech that might be incitement um, uh, to imminent lawless action, um, but any content-based restriction on free speech would be subject to the highest level of scrutiny. Could a state or local government restrict an animal rights protester, for example, for holding a sign that says, meat is murder? Senator, I... Um, would want to think a little more about that, but my, my sense is based on those facts along, alone, um, it would be hard to restrict under the First Amendment uh, that sort of sign. What? what meat is murder? Yeah. What about, uh, it's going to get more interesting. Just stay with me, Senator Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, 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 what, uh, what, what, Kennedy, uh, Holly spent time up at, Yale, up at Yale with those communists. <laughs> What if it had, what if this same sign had a, a picture, a graphic picture of slaughtered animals? Could that be restricted? Um, well, well, Senator, I think the, the, the standard I would apply is um, it, it most likely would come into the form of maybe an, uh, arguably incitement, and, uh, and it, that would not seem to rise to the level of incitement. Does the answer change if it's a pro-life protest that includes graphic pictures of abortion? The answer would not change on the subject matter. So what are the constitutional rules that you would apply when determining whether somebody's graphic speech is constitutionally protected? Well, I would consult First Amendment jurisprudence, and it would depend on the nature of that speech to see which of the standards falls under it. Um, but regardless of which of the standards, if we're talking about a content-based uh, regulation on speech, it would be the highest level of scrutiny. You understand why I'm asking these questions, I assume? Certainly. Yeah, do, do you want, I mean, given what you've said in the past, your past writings, which I think are frankly a, a little bit alarming on this issue, uh, particularly as it relates to, to pro-lifers and the pro-life movement, so maybe you'd like to address that more broadly. Well, well, Senator, I believe, um, uh, and, and I'm happy to do so, um, I wrote a note uh, in the Yale Law uh, Symposium on Law and Technology uh, discussing the Nuremberg Files website, which was a website um, back at the time, I believe this was my first year in law school, so it would have been 1999, um, that listed abortion providers on the website um, and uh, um, uh, with personal information and had blood dripping down, and when someone was harmed or murdered, it would be indicated on that, that site. The position I took, however, in my note, was that that website was protected under the First Amendment. I took the position that the jury in California that issued a $107 million verdict was erroneously instructed, and that under the Watt standard for true threats, um, that would have survived under the true threat standard. So you're, then, you're, you're able, you're telling me that you're, you're able to apply the Supreme Court's instructions on the First Amendment, regardless of who's before you, even if it is pro-life advocates with whom you may disagree? Without question, Senator, yes. Um, and, and, and Senator, I, the last part of your, I started to answer before the last part, uh, it, I, I just don't want to comment about who I would disagree or who would not. Yeah, I don't know what your views that, are, but I just want to make sure that whoever, and I, frankly, I don't care what your personal views are, but I do want to make sure that if there are litigants before you, that you are able to apply in an even-handed manner the very clear instructions by the United States Supreme Court on the First Amendment. You give me that commitment. Senator, you have my assurance that my personal views would have, have nothing to do with my decisions in the case. It would be bound Good. solely by precedent and the law. We may have occasion to talk further about that. Judge Tagliati, let me uh, ask you, um, I, I need to revisit, I know Senator Cruz uh, uh, mentioned this, but uh, I need to revisit uh, the Nevada Supreme Court's uh, unanimous uh, rejection of uh, uh, unanimous overruling of a case of yours and this uh, uh, talk about inherent authority of, of judges. Do federal judges, federal judges now, do they have inherent authority to enjoin state actions without authorization from statutes or the Constitution? In, in, um, in that circumstance where that issue to uh, come before me, I would take the opportunity to review all precedent, the court rules, and the Ninth Circuit. And um, in light of my familiarity with uh, those issues, I would suggest to you that that is a um, um, rare circumstance. What, I, I, can't, I can't think of- What do you mean by rare thought, circumstance? You rarely well, confront the issue? Uh, no, that, that, that would be something that would not be undertaken lightly, and I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, or you'd only rarely issue, you'd only rarely exercise such quote-unquote inherent power. Um, I'd have to know where the authority comes from. Does I'm, it need to come from the statute, or does it, is it inherent in Article 3? 
Well, let me I, ask this a different way. Can you can a court bind parties that are not before it? Could you as a federal court, a federal judge, do you have the inherent authority under Article 3 or elsewhere to bind parties who are not before you? I believe that's a, a hot button issue that's being litigated at this time. Well, why don't you tell me about the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, what's your understanding of the Supreme Court's instruction on this? Well, I, I know there that national uh, injunctions, for example, that have come up this morning ha are being considered. Um, you know, as my fellow nominees have indicated, and I agree with them that I would have to uh, follow Rule 65. What about the Supreme Court's instruction in Gill versus Whitford from 2018 about what district courts have the power to do for parties who are before them? What's your understanding of that case? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as far as being able to interpret that case, um, I would uh, review it before making any decisions. At, at the top of my head right now, I'm not able to recall those facts in that case, and I apologize for that, but um, I am familiar with injunctive relief in the state court. I've handled, I don't, I've handled tens of thousands of cases, uh, literally, uh, and injunctive relief is something that um, needs to be given very c careful consideration when you are prohibiting um, with mandatory relief or otherwise. Um, Let me just ask, this is my last question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just back to your state court experience. First of all, I'll give you a chance to respond to me. We'll, we'll submit some questions for you and you can follow okay. up more fully on the cases that I've asked about. I think this Thank is you. very important, but let's just go back finally to, to your, your experience with the state courts you've been talking about. Do you stand by your position that state court judges in your state in any event have the inherent authority to issue sweeping injunctions? <clears throat> Excuse me, in our state, um, I, I, I would ask you to clarify sweeping injunctions. Uh, do you mean beyond our Why don't you just tell me what you us? think state court judges have the inherent authority to do? Well, to in general, um, for example, the case you mentioned earlier, the attorney general for the state of Nevada, um, as, through the solicitor general, argued to me that, uh, that I had the inherent authority to, um, uh, to manage the enforcement of a court order, of my court order. Um, <clears throat> And so related to, to that specific issue, that was what is, was in play in that case. And, and do, you, do you stand by the, the ruling that you issued in that case? Uh, Senator, no. The Supreme Court reversed me. Uh, the matter was returned back. I signed the execution warrant and proceeded forward with the case. They um, made a decision uh, that I uh, accepted and followed and respect. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me go over.